Hello, today we're going to be talking about blood. We're going to start off by talking about its functions. There are five main functions for blood. First one is the transportation of dissolved gases, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic wastes. Very important in delivering oxygen. The second one is the regulation of the pH and electric light composition of the interstitial fluids throughout the body. It's going to absorb and neutralize the acids and that's going to help regulate the pH. The third one is going to be the restriction of fluid losses through damaged blood vessels and that's going to be through the blood clotting mechanism. The fourth one is defense against toxins and pathogens and this is primarily with our white blood cells and it's going to be with antibodies and the immune system. And then the last function is the stabilization of body temperature. Blood is going to absorb heat that's generated by the skeletal muscles. So you can see here just a little diagram of blood. Um, blood is made up of a liquid portion called plasma and then what we call formed elements, which are blood cells, red and white, and platelets. Um, Blood is much heavier than water, and it's also three to four times more viscous than water. So it's got a very different composition. If you can remember, blood is a fluid connective tissue. And again, it's going to contain plasma and the formed elements. And the formed elements are the red and white blood cells and the platelets. So let's start off talking about plasma. You can see here that the plasma is this yellow color once blood has been centrifuged. Centrifuged, excuse me. It is going to make about 55% of the total blood volume. Then we have a little what we call buffy coat, which is going to be less than 1% of the total blood. And that's going to be our white blood cells or the leukocytes and our platelets. And then we have our red blood cells or the erythrocytes, which is 45% of the total blood. So let's focus in on the plasma. This is again, 55% of the blood. It is the liquid portion of blood and it's made up of plasma proteins and a ground substance called serum. Now the plasma proteins are albumins, globulins, fibrinogens. It also is going to have um, different plasma nutrients, um, which are carbs, lipids, amino acids, it's also going to have um, plasma electrolytes, um, which are going to have the vitamins, minerals, electrolytes, and so forth. Um, it also is going to be about 92% water. And its main function is going to transport nutrients, gas, and vitamins, help regulate fluid and electrolyte balance, and help maintain that pH. And again, it is that yellow portion. Plasma is the yellow portion. It's 55% of blood volume. Plasma proteins are albumins, globulins, and fibrinogen. Now, albumin is the smallest of the proteins, but it's the most plentiful. It's about 60% of the um, proteins that make up the plasma. It is going to help regulate water movement between blood and tissues also going to help control blood volume and blood pressure and it's going to help maintain the osmotic condition that favors recovery of water that has been forced out of the capillaries and into the surrounding tissue. Globulins make up 36 percent of the plasmids and there's three forms that it can exist in. It could be alpha globulin, beta globulin, and gamma globulin. So again alpha, beta, and gamma forms. And that's going to transport lipids and the fat-soluble vitamins and will also act as an antibody for defense. Fibrinogen is the largest of the proteins but the smallest in quantity. Makes up about 4% of the plasma proteins. And that is what's going to be responsible for the blood clotting. So it's going to provide that protein network necessary for the blood to clot so we don't lose blood. The plasma electrolytes... Um, are going to be absorbed from the intestine or released from cellular metabolism processes. And the examples would be sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, and sulfate ions. And the main function of these are going to be in the blood clotting or blood coagulation. 
So you can see here that this is just the plasma component of the blood, and it breaks it down into the different um, proteins, the plasma proteins, albumin, globulins, and fibrinogens, and then the others are the, um, the nutrients and the electrolytes. The formed elements make up the rest of the blood. It's about 45% quantity. And we have red and white blood cells, and we have the blood platelets. Now, as far as this goes, you can see here that the red blood cells are red. I know we've looked at this already in the class. Platelets are what we call little slivers of cells. And then the lymphocytes, um, there's five main types that we'll learn about. And you can see here that the neutrophils is one of those lymphocytes or the white blood cells that you can see. Um, the blood volume of an average adult is roughly about 10 pints. Um, and it is a little bit different for males and females. You can see a female has a little bit of a lesser quantity of whole blood, four to five liters, as opposed to the male with five to six liters. But let's now talk about the red blood cells. The red blood cells are called RBCs, or they're called erythrocytes. Their shape is biconcave, um, and this is a big adaptation for transporting gases. Um, it's going to increase the surface area through which the gases will diffuse, placing the cell membrane closer to oxygen or hemoglobin. Their cells are also very elastic and flexible. They do not have a nucleus when they're mature. They only have a nuclei during early stages of development. Um, and why they don't have the nucleus is it makes more room for the hemoglobin. And they do not have ribosomes or mitochondria. Now, because they don't have the nucleus and the ribosomes, they cannot divide, they cannot go through mitosis, and they cannot um, make proteins. The majority of the red blood cells volume is hemoglobin um, and hemoglobin is very important in transporting oxygen it transports about 99 percent of the oxygen carried by the blood um, the hemoglobin is kind of what gives it its bright red color um, so when the hemoglobin binds to oxygen that's when it's going to be bright red and then you could tell when it's not having oxygen attached, um, it's going to turn blue to purplish in color, and that's because of the deoxygenation. And it kind of is kind of cool because um, old um, heme units are stripped of the iron, and um, they're converted to a green compound called biliverdin. The biliverdin is then converted to an orange-yellow compound called bilirubin. The biliverdin and the bilirubin are collected by the liver and stored in the gallbladder until they're released in the digestive system and the bile. So it's kind of cool how that all will change um, as far as the composition goes. In general, every second, there's about two to three million red blood cells made by the bone marrow. They're gonna circulate for about 120 days and then they get recycled um, by the spleen or the liver, the red blood cells kind of get engulfed and scavenged by cells from the spleen and the liver, okay? And but you have to remember the process hematopoiesis, we had learned about that with the skeletal system, that's red blood cell formation. And that's gonna be very, very important because they're constantly um, being made. About 3 million new red blood cells enter circulation each second. Um, and just so you um, have an idea about this, um, the round trip of one red blood cell from the heart to the peripheral tissues and back to the heart takes about one minute. Um, the red blood cells travels about 700 miles in 120 days. So it's kind of impressive on how that will work. Now there is um, white blood cells that are also, you could tell in that, little buffy coat layer, the white blood cells. Um, they're called WBCs or leukocytes, and they protect against disease and infections. Some cells phagocytize bacterial cells. Some produce antibodies that destroy or disable foreign particles, but they pretty much act as allow for phagocytosis of foreign cells and debris. 
This is going to allow it to act as a mediator of the immune response. Um, another neat fact about white blood cells is they can squeeze between the cells that form blood vessel walls. This movement is called diapedesis, and that allows the white blood cells to leave the circulation. Once it's outside of that blood flow, they use an amoeboid movement. And um, we do have five main types of the white blood cells that we will be talking about. Um, one of the main things with white blood cell count is that if we have high numbers, it can indicate an infection. So the white blood cells are always being counted when you go to the doctor and the average is between 5,000 and 10,000 cells. Now, there are five types. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and the monocytes. Um, and you can tell this little slide shows you the lifespan that it um, exists in the blood and its main function. So um, there are um, a couple of them are granulocytes. These are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Those are the top three. These develop in the bone marrow. And again, they're a pretty short lifespan. The neutrophils um, are the most active white blood cell. They're going to be the ones protecting by engulfing the foreign invaders by phagocytosis. But they can't um, ingest particles larger than the bacterial cells. They do contain lots of lysosomes, though. And they often become engorged with digestive products and bacterial toxins, which causes them to die. But this does give you that yellowish pus that we see in an infection. Cinephils, um, again, are the ones with the granules. Um, these are not as great as phagocytosis. They're going to protect by engulfing foreign invaders, um, but they're attracted to and they kill certain parasites. Um, they also help control inflammation and the allergic re reactions. The last um, granulocyte is the basophil. basophil. Um, they have less of the granules, but they still have that, you know, deep staining property. Um, they do um, have heparin, which is a blood clot inhibiting substance, and histamine, which is going to help trigger the immune response. I'm sorry, the inflammatory response. And they also can um, go through phagocytosis. Now, the monocytes and the lymphocytes, and there's two lymphocytes, um, B and T, those are agranulocytes. They're not granular at all. The monocytes are the largest blood cells. They're about two to three times bigger than the red blood cell. And their nuclei vary in shape. Um, they're very active white blood cell, and they can ingest very large molecules. Um, they phagocytize. They're also attracted to sites of inflammation. The lymphocytes, um, they're slightly larger than the red blood cells. Um, they have a kind of a round nucleus, and they can live for many years. They're the ones that are very important in immunity. They're like the masterminds of the immune systems. They're, again, non-phagocytitic. Um, we have T cells that are um, major um, immune response, and B cells are going to be producing our um, antibodies. Our platelets are also called thrombocytes. So this is the last of the formed elements. This is um, also found in the blood plasma. Um, they're not really complete cells. They're like a sliver of the cytoplasm. Um, they arise from large cells um, that fragment like a shattered plate, and that is what gives us that sliver of the cytoplasm. They do not have a nucleus, and they're about half the size of a red blood cell. Um, they do have um, enzymes that are going to be used in the clotting process, and they go to the site of um, blood vessel injuries immediately, and they clump together, and they form what's called like a plating platelet plug, that adheres to the damaged vessel wall and blocks that blood loss, blood loss. And they will last for about nine days if not activated. Otherwise, the spleen will recycle it. And you can just see there the platelets are the little slivers.
Um, just a couple of quick uh, terms, hemostasis.